Big move. Oh, I'm getting nervous. <laughs> Are we talking about like a mass migration? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's about it's about taking the neuro center of triple zero from a 2016 laptop to a 2020 laptop. And by the way, do note that I noted 2020 in that equation. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> With that, let's start the show. <laughs> hey. All right. All right. I think that was by far the longest pre-show. Let's get the technicals going of all time. Sorry, we tried to go live um, and uh, sorry it didn't work out. But in some ways, it's kind of better because this is our Thanksgiving episode. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Late Night Playset. Today is, as you know, Thursday, November 26th, 2020. And I am saying that with a wink in my eye, because as these guys know, we are recording this on Wednesday night just before, but it is for all of you for the Turkey Day. So I hope that you have enjoyed your turkey and uh, or whatever you have done uh, for this holiday. But uh, I hope that you've given thanks. Uh, that's what we are all about over here. If you watched the show last night, we had Ray Schaefer on and uh, it was a really nice it was a really nice conversation and it was a really nice um virtual hang where we got to hang out with our buddy Ray Schaefer and giving thanks is the theme of the week. So our guests this evening from Triple Zero Magazine, we're going to spend the whole hour with them. Happy Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for that. Uh, we have Pete Stout and Alex. By the way, Alex, I don't know if we've ever met before, but I, I hope I, I'm if saying not. your last name right. Palevsky? You got it. Nailed okay, it on the Okay, okay. Fantastic. So we've got Alex here and Pete as well. And uh, we've got the usual stuff to deal with. There's an East Coast feed and a TBT, but you guys, uh, I am not in any hurry to do it, whereas I am in a hurry to talk to you. So let's just start it up and see where the heck it goes. I will bring everybody in here if I can do so. I think I got this. There we go. Hi. Beautiful. So welcome, welcome, welcome to Alex and Pete. Thank you so much for being here on Thanksgiving, no less. Um, this is, uh, there's no agenda for me. Uh, Pete's a good buddy. We've been dying to do this for a while. Alex, I feel like seeing your face now uh, with the light on it, I feel like we may have met before. You look very familiar to me, but I don't, I know we don't know one another. Very, so very I'm looking possible. forward to getting to know you. Likewise. What's happening, that had to, guys? I'll look that, up, had to be a, that had to be at TJ's place for Rare Shades four weekend and and uh, oh yes if I, you I, were at tj's i was at tj's yeah th you guys were there just at the very beginning uh the ryans were in the house for a little while and just as, as the party was getting started and i'm pretty sure that's when you would have met got it yeah, I, th I think that you're right i think that's exactly what it is and small world uh one of the other speakers you're going to have to help me with his name. I don't remember, but he drives a Ferrari and lives up in the hills. We look up at his house from our pool. Mark, Mark Hadawi. Mark Hadawi, exactly. We ran into him just Sunday at uh, Malibu Kitchen with said Ferrari. Oh, yeah, he, was, nice. he was one of the speakers at that Rare Shades event for the 914. And uh, we brought up that event because of that. I was having a conversation with Paul Kennel from Auto Kramers. And uh, I learned so much about that car. I learned so much. I'm already a big fan of design, Pete, as you know. But I really did learn a lot, and uh, I wanted to thank, I, th I guess, both of you guys for putting that together. Thank you so much. Oh, there are a lot of people who put that together, but you're welcome, and thank you guys for coming. And Mark and Freeman Thomas was another, and then, of, of, of course, the uh, the admittable uh, Francis. Um, Anderton. Anderton was yeah. just, from KCRW, was just fantastic that night as a moderator. Uh, and it was definitely an out there discussion area. Uh, it was the first time I'd... Uh, subject of that night was mid-century architecture and was the first time the which is really why Mark Hadawi was one of the speakers and um, it was the first time that once I kind of connected that that the 914's shape made sense to me finally after looking at it for 30 some odd years yeah that it, it came out of kind of the mid-century modernist movement as interpreted by Porsche designers hmm I think it's absolutely positively stunning now. I just was looking at one at TLG earlier today because our car was in for service. It was a mm -hmm. six, of course, so it had a couple details that just really spoke to me. But uh, uh, the lines on that car are stunning. They really, really are. And I think that you were right when you said, oh, it kind of just had to find its time. Yeah. I mean, if you think about mid the point of that evening, um, you know, if you think about mid-century homes, up until not long ago, maybe a decade ago, a lot of realtors wouldn't show them. They wouldn't they wouldn't even 
show those houses. And a lot of them were Home Depot. You know, they got Home Depot front doors and Home Depot garage doors and vinyl windows and things that only now people are starting to recognize the design value and they kind of have come into their own. And they weren't, they were embraced by a lot of people in period. A lot of people loved the the design and something new. Uh, but they obviously, a lot of people didn't. A lot of people didn't like the untraditional lines. And then they fell out of favor for decades. And there's a lot of parallels that we explored that night. But the biggest was probably how modern the design was, how minimalist the design was, and then how it was, the, you know, the, the sort of catchphrase for Eichler always was, was designed for living. And in buying a mid-century home and living in it for a couple of years, I realized that the 914 was designed for driving. So that was kind of the point of that night. And we know you guys had to take off a little early, um, but... Uh, I think really I think we made I think we ma I think we made the whole thing. That there was yeah I can't remember. There was at TJ's house we stayed the whole time. Oh, you I did. I think that yeah. when we awesome. made the whole thing. Yeah, it was it was the awesome. uh, there was a heat issue. <laughs> there was a heat issue at the uh, the warehouse for the earlier thing. <laughs> had too much <laughs> for heat. the misses. Oh yeah, well that was a too much heat for all of us that day. Yeah, that was just for her and the MS. It was just uh, we couldn't stay unfortunately. But no, we made we made the whole thing at TJ's house. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The, uh, that was a record hot weekend. And uh, little did we know that a museum didn't have air conditioning. Um, <laughs> That's right. Which, which That's makes right. me wonder how but it went. A museum that is not climate controlled. Sure. Yeah. yeah a museum that's not climate controlled. And, and uh, Alex, it makes me wonder a little bit about how their disgusting food exhibit would have gone had it gotten that hot. Yeah. It would have been even more disgusting. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so but we are open books um yeah. i invited alex uh in on this because besides being co-founder of triple zero and besides being cohort in crime at ross periodicals in the late 90s which uh, is which, where we met which is how we met which included such such long gone titles as sports car international and 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 bemmer um besides Thanks all for that, saying bemmer oh, oh yes Oh yeah, uh, the purists that, appreciate it. <laughs> a lot of the Beamer Alex, people just don't get it. Oh, they no, you got it. There were occasional Beamers in Bimmer, but it was generally just about the cars. Generally, don't get me wrong; Bimmer. I love Beamers as well. It's just uh, <laughs> having the appropriate nomenclature. Yeah. Well, this is why I wanted to put the two of you together because uh, when we when I was last with you and you mentioned your passion for BMWs, uh, I knew that the two of you had to meet. Uh, because Alex, really, when he came back to my office in probably what ninety eight or so, nineteen ninety eight, um, we really didn't talk much. I'd see him in the hall here and there. He was busy working in the old. Um, well, when office. Pete says in the hall, he means literally in the hall. <laughs> yes. That's where my office was in the hall, <laughs> and and that was my office before it was his. <laughs> And and um, it was literally top of the stairs, kind of in a corner. With the with later, it had the only internet computer. Um, yeah. We all had to share. Uh, if but, you were gonna be generous, you could call it an alcove. If you were gonna so, be generous, yeah. So is it really any surprise that the print people from with Ross in their background were the toughest to get the technical side going this evening? Um, so <laughs> Alex, Alex, Alex comes into my office, and I had this. Okay, I had an office at least, but it was this tiny office. I think it was carved out of like a like a heating unit or something. But it was legitimate. It had a door. It had a door. It had a door. But my computer, I had like a Mac 2E, and every now and then the hard drive would fire up like a like a like a sawmill. So, uh, friends could hear it on the phone. Like a friend in Prague, he said, "Is that your computer?" <laughs> so Alex comes back one evening after hours, as only the editors did. The only people there after hours. Yeah. Were Otherwise, ghost town. Like 501, you could hear a pin drop. 455. 455, <laughs> 455 yeah. So, uh, so I'm sitting there writing something, and Alex comes and just unannounced just sits down, the, the only chair in there besides mine, and says, um, says, you know, I really want to get an early M6, but I can't oh. decide between. Okay, let me correct you. In 1998, it was just an M6. Yeah, well, that's because right. Because the second M6 yeah. did not exist yeah. yet. I really want to get an just M6. just an M6. Correct. Yeah. Uh, really want to get an M6. I can't decide between 87 
or, or 88, 87 has the leather door tops, 88's got the good bumpers. And I thought inwardly, I thought with the shorter this overhang, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. A much worldwide better looking bumpers. bumpers. Yeah, and I was, right. I was like, okay, this guy's a freak, and we're gonna get along. Yeah, and I looked at him, <laughs> and I said, dude, you got to get the good bumpers. I mean, it's not even a question. Forget the leather door tops. You got to get the bumpers. And we ended up going up to Portland together uh, and to getting that car. I was ended it Portland up or Seattle? Idiot. No, that was Portland. It was Portland. Yeah. Wow. I drove it down. I found a car that had never left Portland, sold new at Cooney BMW Cadillac in Beaverton, Oregon. That's amazing. It, How many it, miles? It had it was an 88 with 88,000 miles, but it was oh, cool. dead. It was dead stock. Dead stock. Like it was still on the TRX wheels and it still wow. had the it still had the self-leveling rear suspension which was malfunctioning. So, you know, <laughs> basically <laughs> We basically drove back down the five like a low rider with malfunctioning hydraulics. Right. <laughs> it, was, it would just sag, right? It would just sag. Yeah, it'd, yeah. It would pop up and then sag and then pop up and then sag. <laughs> <laughs> but that car was incredible Other in terms of that. It was great. That car was, it had the best seats. Yeah, great uh, seats. Oh, the seats were killer. And we got back from driving from Portland to, to San Francisco straight. He dropped me off in Berkeley. And I was so fresh, I wanted to go play basketball, and I did that night. You know, I, was, I wasn't tired at all. Of course, 20-something, so there's that. <laughs> oh, but, yeah. Mm, good point. But 20-something in those seats for those hours, I, I, was, I was literally shooting hoops for several hours after getting home. That's amazing. Uh, well, my BMW history is not nearly as storied as his. But by the way, b while we were trying to get the technicals figured out, Alex was like, can we talk BMW? And I was like, well, let's, let's just talk about it on the air. Um, I was a, I found an E30 very early in life. My dad passed away, uh, uh, when I was 18 and I got a little bit of scratch and I went and traded his Jeep Cherokee in for, a, for a, 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 a 10 year old E30. So it was, which, it was an 86 mom? in 1996. But, oh, where did Pete go? <laughs> Don't worry. I'm here. I'm, I'm adapting since I've had to make technical adaptations. There we go. Well, don't mind. So <laughs> Uh, so anyway, that's where it started for me, and it was a 325e, and uh, and I just was always a three series guy. So I had the M3 after that, and then I got my 944 turbo. Uh, but after that, it was three series always, uh, uh, and I guess e36, e46, couple two e4, two e46s, two e92s, and then the uh, f82. Oh no, I had one of those. I did have a couple other things. I had a z. Whatever the previous generation Z, where they didn't have an M, it was only an IS, but it was the M version. I can't remember which one. Oh, you had the F eighty nine or E eighty nine? I think. I can't remember the the hard top clamshell one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You had a thirty five IS. Is that what you? Yeah, had? exactly. It yeah, was yeah, the yeah. eighty two thousand dollar Z. At, at what the point, hell? They, it had basically become a Mercedes SL. That's exactly what that's exactly what happened. It didn't have the weight, but it was trying to have the cachet and certainly the price right. tag was climbing up there. Uh, so I did have one of those too, but and then the last the most new one and then the last new car and the last BMW I had was uh the F82 M4 whenever that whenever that came out 15 16 right. something like that. Right. And I loved the ferociousness of it at first. I was like, "Holy shit, M made an AMG." And I right. quickly grew tired of all of Very that. Very spiky power delivery. I quickly grew tired of all of that. You didn't have to drive the car anymore. You didn't even have to be good to get it to go fast. And uh, while it's a spectacular machine, it was no longer for me. And I also realized that when I looked for something okay. else that, oh, new cars may no longer be for me. <laughs> and that's right. when we literally bought, uh, a, at the time, I guess it was probably 10 years old, uh, the 911 that we have, Carrera S. It's funny how that all happened. But between those two Porsches, it was, it was predominantly uh, BMWs. Yeah, so my arc just started earlier than yours. Like I went from f through E30, E36, E46, 330i performance package. I didn't have an M3 in that generation. Z3, no, neither did I. I. I had the I had the 2005 M Sport. Whenever that came out, it was the non M3 M3. Yep, yep, got it. Yep. So yeah, I mean there were there were a bunch, and then a couple of five series mixed in there, and the M6 that Pete and I picked up. And uh, oh, I had an X5 4.8 IS for a minute, which I that was a cool car. Absolutely loved. 
That uh, was a cool car. And dead reliable too. Uh, Not dead reliable. <laughs> no, <laughs> I was gonna but say amazing to drive. Dead unreliable, but amazing to drive. <laughs> Particularly on the five for family vacation. Oh God, water pump city. You know that car? I bet I haven't. I haven't driven one in probably ten years, maybe more than that. Uh, uh, I can't imagine. You know, it was so much car at the time. Nowadays, what they're doing with SUVs and with the active suspensions and just how they're able to throw weight around, I think the Urus is what comes to mind, especially because it's so heavy and so effing fast and capable. I kind of almost wonder if that car would be laughable at this point. That What's old amazing about it is. The, the Achilles heel from a modern context is not the chassis. The chassis still holds up to any modern SUV. It's That's incredible. A good point. The engine's good, you know, non turbocharged. So you have to adjust your expectations of torque and everything, but really good for a normally aspirated V8. The Achilles heel is the ZF six speed automatic, which feels 200 years old, even though it's like 15. Like the, the, the evolution of that ZF automatic has come so far that the six speed now feels like a Commodore 64 to like, a, you know, a late, you know, it just. Mr. Ryan, Mr. Corporate. Ryan, may I, may I uh, introduce you to what we call the Pulaski 3000? <laughs> I, I the, guess. What you, is it? It's, it's Alex. Um, oh, I, now uh, I understand. <laughs> No, I mean, yeah. the Polevsky 3000 really comes out when we're we're trying to, you know, track down some car with, like, some obscure feature. But I'm just giving you my general review of the X5 4.8. Yeah, but the fact that you can dig into the the ZF 6-speed, I, I just dig it. I mean, it's, it's just, just good. It, See, it, now, the funny thing was I was actually just in the conversation, and I was like, oh, wait, Pete wants to tell us something. Oh, hang on. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> You're seeing it. You're hearing what. Yeah, this is the thing I wanted to tell you, but I, I don't. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, no, I, no, that's I just, so funny. My, my only point was that the engine holds up, the chassis holds up, the transmission doesn't hold up so much. That's my. That's my twenty-second review. But you know, looking at the two of you from the Porsche perspective, I, I've always loved BMW from when I was a kid, and particularly, I mean, back in the eighties when it made its biggest imprint on me, probably. Yeah. Uh, 70s a little bit. Um, you know, our neighbors got a, 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 a 530i. Um, mm -hmm. E12. E12. And uh, he was a contractor and, and very successful. And actually, it was Justin's dad. And, oh, yeah. Um, and so he, uh, he was like, the, he was the cool dad on the block. Like mm -hmm. all the other dads were like one was a Chevron engineer and my dad was a mechanical draftsman at the lab and um, there was a cop and and here you know Mr. Page was the cool guy with with like long hair and a seventies mustache and, and uh, <laughs> the cool he guy listened, he listened to K Fog you know which was the big deal you know kind of good stuff and and so you know uh, he I just remember him saying. I didn't like the back of the car. I was pretty young in my car enthusiasm. I didn't like how it sloped down in the back. And I mentioned that. I was like, oh, you know, this needs a spoiler or something. And I was probably like eight. And, and he says, uh, he says, son, that's 140 mile an hour rear end. And uh, I, I'll never forget him saying that. Uh, but of course, that, that, it was a, that was a Gondini design, wasn't it? Was it? I believe it was. Yeah, yeah but, same, but same guy that designed the Countach. In my older age, I know that well, <laughs> well before 140 miles an hour, that thing would have warped its cylinder head. Um, those things, if you turned on what, if you turned on the well, AP, that's because they were they were in the thermal reactor emissions control period, which was a dark, dark period where everything basically just cooked underneath the car. You know, totally. like a giant broiler attached underneath the car. Totally. So by ev the, <laughs> everything just over overcooked itself. But by the 80s, BMW was on its game. You know, oh, yeah. the E28, E30, um, E32, 34, like all this stuff was coming out. And I remember just being blown away by BMW. Every BMW was special. A, a 528E rolling by in Berkeley was a special car. I knew that it was different than everything else. Sure. But, but at, looking at your passion for BMWs, which I share, I could never get my head around a company where things like radiators were considered a limited service life uh, item. You know, it, it blew my mind the idea that that you were supposed to replace a radiator at 50,000 miles. 
Um, that's so something that there, just there's some strange Achilles heels with all 80s, 90s BMWs. Radiators are one, and water pumps, fuel pumps. Fuel there's pumps, just, yeah. There's just certain parts that will leave you stranded by the side of the road, which really don't need to be that way. Like you'd think they could come up with a reliable fuel pump, but for some reason they can't. I mean, um, not to <laughs> not to ignore you know rear main seals and intermediate shafts, sure. and chunking or or you know head studs or, or or premature valve guide wear. But you know, I think about my brother's Boxster, which was our old Boxster. It now has we got it with its original in its engine at sixty thousand miles, and then we sold it to my brother and his wife with I think a hundred thousand miles, and now that car's got two hundred and thirty thousand miles in the original engine, radiators, all that stuff is original. Which on a 986 Boxster is damn impressive. Like, that's pretty insane. Yeah. Yeah, the, the 2.5 <laughs> cars are pretty good. Supposedly, the 2.5 cars are some of the the best in regards to that. Um, but anyways, no, it always surprised me because Porsche has its Achilles heels too, for sure. Any car does. You know, That's I think what I think. This- any, any, any machine does. Anything with moving parts does. Yeah. We have this strange thing where we've been trained by solid state stuff and other things where we think something as complex as a car is going to be as reliable and simple to use as a toaster. And it, it's a, it, it's a, it's an odd thing. They are but if not, you buy a Honda. What's that? They are if you buy a Honda or a Toyota. True-er. True-ish. Yeah. 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 But you know what, though? I'll say, with the exception of one Porsche over all the years... The Porsches I've had, plus all the press cars, have been extraordinarily reliable and and easy to maintain. Um, whereas a lot of friends at BMWs, I'm shocked by the nickel and diming, except it's five hundred dollar nickels and thousand dollar dime. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <You know? laughs> it, it, it's true. I mean, I think eighties, seventies, eighties, nineties BMWs, and into the the mid two thousands are at their core, very reliable cars. They're, they're very sound, well-made cars, but they're taken down by a few sporadic parts that can like yeah. the whole ship, you know? Yeah. But the later cars, I don't think are co- at their core sound, reliable cars, but that's a different discussion. What was the last good seven series? It was um, the uh, E38. It's the one that before Bengal, right? Great car. Yeah, yeah, the one yeah. before Bengal. Yeah, the Ronin, the no, not Ronin. Yeah, the, the Ronin one was great, it, or, or Transporter, or one of those. No, it was in Transporter. it was in the James, yeah, Transporter, and in one of the James Bond movies. You're exactly oh. right. It was the remote control car in James Bond. Yeah, yeah that yeah. was the launch. In fact, like a, that was the period when they were launching cars with James Bond. They had a contract, right? Because the Z3 right. first yeah. launched with uh, yes. Goldeneye. Yes. In fact, they had that color. the The color was like a special Bond blue. Uh, so, well, it was. You want to get full anoraki? Cause no, because I know that the, the BMW dealerships hated that. We all called it Bond Blue. What was it really called? It was. It was actually called Atlanta Blue Metallic. Right. And it was named after the BMW sponsorship of the 1996 Olympic Games, which were held in Atlanta. Oh, and wow. it happened to be the the launch color of the Z3. Not to be confused with Atlantis Blue Metallic. Which is- <laughs> individual color which at least one person has made the mistake of accidentally ordering and being very surprised oh, when their no. Atlanta blue car showed up instead of their Atlanta blue how different are they <laughs> completely different oh Atla- God. Atlantis is like a teal almost whereas oh Atlanta- no <laughs> yeah. oh, so you're expecting the movie <laughs> car and you show up and you get oh no teal <laughs> exactly, so like is, the, exactly. Is, it, is it there exactly. wimbledon green uh w- w- i'm sorry what'd you say about wimbledon green is it is it bmw's wimbledon green kind of you know the the, the it's not in its color tone but in its confusion of naming it's the bmw equivalent of porsche's Golf blue and golf blue. Oh, very oh. good. <laughs> very good. That was a great analogy. Quick, too. <laughs> good comedian. I told you. Pulevsky 3000. Um, so at a, at a much less glamorous uh, venue than anything James Bond, uh, I think it was the third Lemons race at the Altamont. Uh, mm. Some BMW mechanics showed up with an E38, probably like a 740, and they claimed they got it for 500 bucks. And that Uh-oh. didn't go. That didn't go well with anybody. Uh, I, I don't believe it. it now. 
I don't know if you could ever buy one for 500 bucks. Right. Maybe. I feel like even a, tr a crashed one, a trashed one, I feel like something that's been on fire, it's worth more. Oh, oh yeah. So, so, the, so as you may know, they, they have an award at that race called the people's curse. And, um, <laughs> Effectively, what they can do is is they, they take a they take a vote, and if everybody curses one of the cars, uh, they go to work on it. They pull it off the track during the race. You have to come in, they black flag you, and they and they took they took this thing out to a dirt parking lot, and Jay had rented Jay Lamb, who actually oddly enough was both of our first boss. We both met uh, working for Jay Lamb. It wasn't technically my first boss, but my my first boss came in as his replacement. Just oh, that's as, right, Randy Riggs. Yeah, just yeah, yeah. as I was hired, but I knew him. He was still around the office, so I yeah. still had interactions with him. Wow. So long before the Lemons days. So, so, so Jay, uh, so Jay pulled black flags. I think pulls this E thirty eight in pretty mint condition, actually, even after enough laps with Lemons. And he had rented a bobcat with one of those uh, those like poker tools on top. You know, those, how did those, I, those... I envisioned this already? Yeah. <laughs> And and uh, and he also had a crane, uh, like a big crane. I think and, uh, it's like, like a concrete could... pick, the thing that you're talking about, yes. right? They just kind of, yes. yeah. Yeah, and so we're all watching. You know, I wasn't driving at that time. So, was, you know, I was up there at the fence with everybody else. And so this guy goes over in the bobcat and, and just like thing goes over the top of this, over this uh, bobcat. It's just, and it just starts just, it's just a spike. And it's just like going through the roof. And then the guy like backs up in that awkward way with the bobcat and goes over to the front and starts picking at the front hood um, at the engine, you know, at the V8 in there yeah. uh, under the hood. And then uh, the, um, the thing still runs, the thing's still running. So he, um, the crane comes over and they pick it up by the right rear door. Uh, they pick the car up by the right rear door. They first they picked it up the car and dropped it. And um, then the guy got the door open somehow and picked it up with the crane with the door and like unbelievable swung the seven series around by the door by the passenger rear door. And it reminds me of the old Volvo commercials when they would do shit like that to show the mm -hmm. structural integrity oh, yeah. of the car. Oh yeah, wow. and, and all of us, all of us had been laughing, and it's just we all went silent. I think because we couldn't believe that that four or five thousand pound BMW was being held up by those two hinges and being jerked around for quite a while before finally the door came loose and it was way up there. And that thing came down on the ground with an almighty thump. I'm sure it bottomed all four, you know, all four suspension points, drove it right back in the race. Wow. It was unreal. Wow. And if it was the Bengal 7 Series, it would have just imploded before the crane even <laughs> yes. touched it. Yes. It would have just been parked next to the crane. It would have just exploded from the inside out. Actually, I think the crane would have just rejected it. The crane would have been like, no, just no. I'm wow, like, no. that is really something. The structural integrity those cars had. I mean, they just they were so damn good looking. I remember the commercial campaign when they first came out. I don't know if you remember this, Alex. <laughs> you probably will. Uh, the commercial campaign when that seven series first came out was um, that the whole the whole idea was that it was the chassis of a race car, and they kind of did the explodeo view where that you know there was kind of okay nothing from nothing to the actual street car that you could buy in the showroom that was all leather tough. Oh, you mean like like a race car morphed into the street car? Like yes. That? Yes, except that it was that 7 Series as a race car. It wasn't like, oh, there was an M1 that became... Oh, so they made like a 7 Series that looked like a race car? Yes, and they sort of explodo viewed it as well. Interesting. Yeah, it was wild. Huh. And it was sort of, it was the first, and, and I just remember that, that it was so long and it was so wide and so flat. It just was so sexy looking. And when yeah. everything else at the same time was doing the cab forward, like the Dodge Avenger was out, of, not the Avenger, what was it? The Dodge. Uh, the 300. The, the Intrepid. The oh, Intrepid. Exactly. Oh, Thank the you. The Intrepid, Intrepid came yes. out with cab forward design. And it was like, yeah. you know, the Americans were pushing in a different direction. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, that seven that was, was so sexy. That Raymond was Thomas was loop. deep in those cab forward days, wasn't he? I think yeah. so. I think he was. Uh, I remember that Chrysler 300. It was sort of the Intrepid with this weird front grafted on. It was It um, was the later version of that of yeah. that car. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Same greenhouse, but with a very, like, yes. stubbed off front end. Pre, right. Pre-rent. Yeah. pre -rent Boxy. Before yeah, the rent. Yeah, yeah. Before yeah. the rent. It was the Charger, right? It, was the, it became the Charger later? 
No, the Charger. Wasn't the Charger the Benz underneath? Oh, you're right. That was Daimler later. You're right. Yeah, no, that was that was the Charger was based on that E Class platform. The 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 um the cab forward cars were the Intrepid, the Eagle and Vision, or Concord. Remember the Concord? yes, the, and the Eagle Vision exactly. Eagle Vision, yes. yeah. Eagle. yeah. When yeah. was the last time you saw an Eagle on the road? It would have been a Talon. I guarantee that it wasn't a Vision, and it wasn't it wasn't you know anything AMC Eagle. Yeah, yeah it had, a, had to be like a Talon, which was the Eclipse, yeah. right? Yeah, all that stuff is just gone. Yep. Um, it's kind of even here in California, which is usually a lot of cars are saved by the environment, you know, in terms of the, the climate. I feel like I feel like the eclipses lasted because of Paul Walker. There's that whole, you know, there's the tuner market and the and the the racer and just oh, the, tribu the tribute car builder market. I mean, yep. You think you think about that car in its time. I mean, all wheel drive. Uh, you know, oh. twin cam four. The TSI valves, was sick. Charged. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that engine was that engine was and still is a gem. I mean, yep. Yeah, great engine, and it had all-wheel drive, and yep. it was, you know, visually attractive in its segment at a price that was hard to beat. Weren't they like twenty-five grand, something like that? Yeah, it was like everything the probe wanted to be that wasn't. Totally. Oh yeah. Totally. Well said. That was although, mean, but well said. Although, as Pete and I remarked recently at a gas station in Colorado, the second-generation Probe GT is very good-looking. <laughs> I will admit that. Is that the one where they move the license plate down? <laughs> I can't believe you just went there. It, it, um, it's, it's it's much cleaner. It doesn't have all the straking that the first generation had. Oh, it's no, no, right, like right. It's a much sexier organic. car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got yeah. the nice little, uh, the eyelets in the front. Yeah. Uh, right. But, you know, yep. don't forget the MX-6 in, in this mix. Well, the you MX-6 know? is the twin, well, the twin. The, uh, the mechanical twin to the probe, yeah. Exactly. Right. But it had the 911 greenhouse. It had the greenhouse of a 996 almost. Yep. Kind of did. And those make incredible – somebody used one of those for a replica at Lemons. I'm trying to think of what they – was it – Probably – No. It could, be, it could be a 959. You could make all sorts of things out of that. No, somebody used a, a Ford ZX2 coupe uh, to make, a, uh, to make a, a, a Flying Lizard RSR. It was pretty impressive. Oh, actually. that's good. That that I can't picture, but I'm sure it was terrible. It, it was <laughs> kind, of, kind of amazing. You know, I'm not sure how it is that you know you get on the get on the horn with the triple zero people when we don't talk Porsche. Um, maybe it's because it's like we feel like we've got a hall pass and we can get out and just be car people. It's Thanksgiving, that. guys. We're talking. It's a free for all. There's no there's no agenda. I will say though that we're about halfway or so through. So I'll just I'll just we'll do a quick pause here. Speaking of BMW, this isn't BMW related, other than the guy who we're going to do our East Coast feed with happens to uh, work at Ridgefield BMW in uh, BMW. Uh, Richfield, Connecticut. Yeah, I'll try. I'll, I'll get all that stuff straight. I need some some more uh, pre Thanksgiving wine. Yes, <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm only having water, but in the old <laughs> days, man, for sure. Uh, anyway, East Coast feed. Let's just check in real quick. I believe they have a Thanksgiving message for us. So roll it, Hal. Broken the Cas, man. Oh my God, Mr. Right. What now? <laughs> Hi, Mr. Ryan. Happy early Thanksgiving. Look, it's Brooke and the Cas, man. <laughs> East Coast feed. <laughs> So since it's Thanksgiving week, we're uh, actually enjoying a nice meal that we just uh, grub hubbed, whatever. Um, <laughs> but Brooke wanted to really go do her hair, and I told her she couldn't because this is more important. Um, I just want to let you know, I'm showing her a classic tonight. I like showing her a movie she's never seen, and we're watching The Birdcage because we are family, you included, Mr. Ryan, and it is Thanksgiving week. And even her, she came to hang out. There we go. Uh, P.S. Next week, we're getting a new kitten. Right, babe? Oh. Mm -hmm. Look how excited. Look, she's so pumped about it. Still allergic <laughs> to cats and all the fun. Love you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. I love you guys. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Brooke and Kazman, uh, and everybody else. Uh, very quickly, let's just do a TBT. It's uh, This one is quick, and it's it's... It's not even anything Porsche-related, but um, that seems to be the theme of the day. I, I, I didn't want – something happened recently, and I didn't want it to go unrecognized. And it's, it's, it's sort of a bummer, but I want it to be more of a celebration. Somebody passed away um, from the Letterman family, somebody who used to be a stagehand on the show, somebody who used to be shown quite frequently on the show. Uh, his name was Kenny Sheehan. And if you watched the show ever, you, you definitely would recognize this guy. I just want to play a quick clip. Um, this is actually, it would be property of Worldwide Pants, but it has been taken without permission from the Don's YouTube channel, which I will link below. 
And uh, um, here we go. Really quick. Kenny Sheehan. Roll it out. TBT. All right, so we set off a couple of weeks ago to get a transcript from an Oprah Winfrey show. And, to, and tonight, that transcript, an excerpt, is going to be read to you uh, by a couple of our stagehands, Pat Farmer and uh, Kenny Sheehan. Now, in this episode of the Oprah Winfrey show, Oprah is visited by a celebrity guest. Boys? My next guest is a real designing woman who's created her very own clothing line for women size 14 to 28. Please welcome Delta Burke. Thank you. <laughs> you look good, girl. Thank you. I knew I couldn't do those diets anymore that I did in my 20s. Of course you have to find the space spiritually, emotionally, and physically best for yourself. It's all in the journey, yeah, to get to the place where you feel good about you. And you're finally there. I'm finally there and I love it. That's amazing. <laughs> so there you so go. Good. There you go. R.I.P. Kenny Sheehan. Oh, you were the you were a really cool guy. Really cool guy. Um, uh, that's it. That's it. I just wanted to do that. <laughs> those all of those there. There are so so many of those Oprah's transcripts that that was a segment they did for I don't know. It seems like years and years. Uh, but Don also Don Giller of the fabulous Don Giller YouTube channel. Over a hundred million views just recently, by the way. Uh, that's legit. Um, he put together a compilation several hours long uh, of all of the bits that Pat and, and uh, Kenny used to do together. And it's just delightful. Even if you don't know the guy uh, or what kind of a person he was, um, it's just very, really funny entertainment. It's good stuff. So highly recommend. And uh, RIP Kenny Sheehan. So there you go. But back to these guys. All right. Let's bring us all back in here. Do, 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 do. Well, that's a different order. That's going to screw up the Chiron. <laughs> Is that the new Bugatti model? Where? The Chiron. Oh, yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> how do you say that? Is it Chiron or Chiron? I don't know. How do, are you supposed to say Chiron. Chiron? I don't know. It's got a Maricor problem, doesn't it? Um, for other people, it? whenever you see the little the names on there in the industry, they call that Chiron. I guess a lot of people probably don't know ah. that. Ah. It's sort of a it's, it's Kleenex. It was the original company that made the machine that did the thing, character generation. I'm saying Kleenex because it's sort of a generic term. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So the Chiron is the machine that makes the little name tag it, under the screen? It was in the old days. Now, yeah, anybody uh, can do it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, all right. So we covered how you guys met before, and we certainly talked a lot about a lot of things. Should we talk a little bit about Porsche? Because I, <laughs> I know, I know, it you know, seems to be the subject of the magazine and all. Yes. Yeah, and you know, I feel badly for any viewers who tuned in for the complete sidetrack once again. I think we, I think we've, uh, I don't know, we like sidetracks, but uh, yeah, let's 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 talk Porsche. Are we talking brown nine elevens? Are we talking? 992 GT3s? Are we talking uh, cars on Pikes Peak? Are we talking uh, yellow 997s? Or... <laughs> oh, wow. We're, well, let me see. We're open to all these are those the categories? <laughs> yes. Let me see, Alex. Oh. oh, it's not Alex anymore. Let me see, Ken. Um, no, I just, in general, I wanted to know what's going on with you guys. How is the magazine going? Uh, I didn't bring mine to hold up. I meant to, and I forgot. I'm sorry. But Triple Zero Magazine, obviously, all I'm of sure our Pete portion people know. Around there, or I can. Well, I've got, you know, Alex can hold up a, I've got a S copy within reach, which is the, uh, let me see if I can figure oh, out. Oh, there it is. Beautiful. So, um, yeah, paper, the, the non hardback version. And gorgeous. Then, um, so this is kind of a, this is one you don't see as often. I just have to figure out how to work this backwards. Um, wow. But these are- You've got to hold it a little lower so people can see the image, I think. There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the bin, there's a metal bin plate here. Um, this and, is, uh, here, I'll, go ahead, Pete. I'll, I'll give you full, uh, you go ahead. There we so go. It's, so it's, this is the, the new issue or the latest issue, and it is just 
there with the delay and everything. Um, so this is the, the S version, which is hand bound actually in Arizona. That's that, stunning. Uh, it looks uh, weighty. Oh, it is. They, they, if you get the, they come in an aluminum slipcase for the year. And um, by the time you have four of these in the aluminum slipcase, it's a monster to pick up and move around. But um, which is a good thing we won't. <laughs> it's a monster. <laughs> it, it's a good thing we went with the aluminum slipcase because I don't think cardboard would have cut it weight wise. Um, but no, the newest issue, it's got the art car on the cover, which was a wild, pretty wild uh, endeavor. Uh, I gained a tremendous amount of respect for anybody who puts a race team together, uh, even if they've got a year to do it. We did it in about three weeks, went from a art project to a race car. Um, but it was super worth it. We got to know David Donner in that process and uh, what an incredible driver and great person all around and someone beloved in the mountain community there at, at, at Pikes Peak and for good reason. So you know, we would have been, Alex and I decided we would be happy if the car just got to the starting line. We had no idea. Um, we, we didn't give ourselves permission to hope that it would win, I guess is the way to put it. Oh, uh, well, that is an interesting way to put it. Is that true, Alex? Yeah, I mean, the whole saga you can read about in the in the issue, it's it's pretty interesting how it all unfolded, but it was just one of those, let's make an art car which led to a car winning its class at Pikes Peak. And everything that happened in between was kind of a whirlwind. Um, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it started with a joke in a paddock in a really un pretty racetrack uh, called Pueblo uh, Motorsports Park. But it's a good track, um, just not a... Not a picturesque track. Not a picturesque track. And uh, uh. Donner was leaving and... Um, I just asked if he was racing this year and he said, no, you know, I'm not racing this year unless you want to, um, unless you want to loan me something interesting. And, and, uh, the owner said, well, what would be interesting? And he said, I don't know, one of those. And he pointed to the car basically. Yeah. That or neither oh, was. wow. They the pointed, car pointed to that car. Like, yeah. 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 So we, we drove, we built the car. Well, we wrapped the car. We designed a wrap for the car for a photo shoot on Pikes Peak. Uh, we closed the road and shot up there with Larry Chen uh, with that car and a, and a 935 and bare carbon. And that was already dreamlike. And the idea was, what's the prettiest location? Um, and the idea to drive those race cars on a closed road on Pikes Peak without the speed limit was pretty fun. Um, but the next day, we went to a racetrack where we could actually really use the cars because you don't want to. You don't want to be a bad guest when when Pikes Peak is working with you to close the road. Uh, nor do you really want to. Nor do you really want to go off the side when there's stuff like two thousand foot drops, and, uh, <laughs> yeah. lots of rocks. You don't want any bad vibes at Pikes Peak. Yeah. Any, any. Yeah. No, and so the next day we the, the driver in the ninth. I drove the art car, and then the driver in the in the nine thirty five was David Donner. The, you know, the owner said, "Do you mind if I bring him?" And I thought, you know are you kidding? Six time winner, uh, three time overall. And there was no time to talk to him on the Hill. The next day we got to talk to him at the track and he was just really a, a, a neat dude. And, and it was pretty funny. I watched Alex. He was talking, he was, he was sort of saying to us, he's, you know, I, I canceled all my car magazine subscriptions. Uh, there just wasn't anything in them anymore. It was just all fluff. And I was listening to Donner say this and I was like, and he might be one of our people. And so yeah. as, I was as soon thinking, as he said that, I was like, well, then I've got a magazine for you. Yeah, Alex is like, and, and he'd never seen out. it before. Yeah. And he just started paging <laughs> through and you could tell by the way he was paging through triple zero. He's like, he is one of us. And I, he find does that, want I find that when you hold it in your hands, you know, immediately. Yeah, you know, I mean, you the don't. content is that. its own thing, but the quality is in your hands. We saw that with Rensport. Some portion, it's not for everybody. And, and we knew that going in. He, You'd see people, some people would come up and they'd, they'd kind of take a few pages through and then they'd put it back and walk away. And other people would start looking and just hand over their credit card without saying yep. a word. And yep. uh, Donner surprised us. He was definitely one of us. And then at the end of that track day, he was leaving. And the joke, when everybody stopped laughing, uh, I said, what would it take to put you on the hill? And the only reason he could enter was because he had been a past winner. Uh, it was already past the deadline for entry. And so I think but they 
they gave him a special exemption because he's he's kind of royalty there, and a, and a previous winner, and so he he ended up I think two or three weeks from when we were around that picnic table set. Uh, he was at the he was at practice in the car in the art car on the hill. Um, so and I think three four weeks after that joke, he won the race. Yeah, I was going to say, and, and as we, no spoilers here, but uh, that ended up working out quite well. Yeah, yeah, we were happy just to get the car on the hill. Just it was a dream come true just to see it entered. And, exactly. You know, other teams that had a year or six months or 10 months or three months or whatever they had had to prepare. And poor Donner had a completely, as far as I know, the only completely factory car on the, on the hill. There were no no trick parts, no evolutions, no nothing. I don't and think I realized that. I don't think I knew that till right now. Yeah, it was yeah. dead stock as delivered, other than you know suspension adjustments and things to make it handle better on the on the on the road. But no yeah. modifications. Factory wow. spring set, the factory spring set a little softer, uh, but factory springs or, or you know, factory approved springs and then the factory SRO front spoiler lip, which is homologated by Porsche. It's a Porsche part. No other changes, no deletions, no weight savings. Isn't that so? No, funny? nothing. Like, and the way he won it was uh, by being David Donner, leaving a little on the table, um, yep. which can be a bit of a metaphor for life, I think. I, um, I was, I'm glad you said that. You know, um, it, it really was uh, it work. It's funny. I talked to Donner today, actually, just maybe an hour before uh, we struggled to get the speed going. <laughs> and um, <laughs> and that phone call worked perfectly, I'll let you know. But uh, it as, worked as out we, great, Pete. But you're going to do that mass migration and get the new computer going over the break. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical <laughs> Remember, it's a 2020 computer, so I, 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 fair enough. I think I'll wait till this issue is like completely printed and mailed, and then maybe I'll migrate. But uh, but you know, speaking with Donner, I, I I said you know I'm thankful I'm thankful for for you. I'm thankful that this he is he was and and is a high point of 2020. You know, this has been a year that racing and motorsport has been challenged even further than it has been lately. And the car industry has been challenged. We can't be together. We can't do things in quite the way that we did. Yeah. And a lot of races don't haven't happened. I mean, IMSA and some others have done a great job of still holding events without fans. But Pikes Peak is really an unusual event and romantic in a way that very few races still are, like Monaco or Le Mans or the Isle of Man TT. And they, you know, the Pikes Peak crew did a great job in pulling this off this event off a couple months late. And Donner was a highlight that we didn't ex expect in a year that hasn't been an easy one for anybody. Yeah, well said. Well said. A bright spot. Yep. Uh, yeah. How was it running? I mean, Pikes Peak, not only is it, it, it's not like it's just, oh, later in the day. I mean, it's a different season even where, than when it normally uh, is run. And weather's an issue there anytime. Always. Always. Yeah, exactly. So how was that? Was it better? Was it worse? The same, just different? It was strange. The day that we, we went up on the day that the race should have been or very close to it was for the day of our photo shoot, which is the only reason we could get the photo shoot done was when we did the photo shoot, it was race week. It was as planned for race week. And but of we course, one it delayed, so nothing was happening. It was supposed to happen in June and the race happened in, instead in late August. And so we went to shoot in June and, or was it July? Um, yeah, so, so right after when the race, I guess, would have happened. Um, and the weather was fabulous. I mean, it was sunny and, and, and nice and warm and it was, it was great. It was Alex's first time on a hill. I'd been twice, once with hail and once with reasonably nice weather. And, and, um, and you never know what you're going to get. It could be sunny in, in, at the bottom and ice and snow at the top. You just, that's. The deal you're you know you're rising thousands of feet in just 12 miles yeah um above the tree line and and uh you get up to the top and oxygen is it is scarce you know this is the only race i know of where they run oxygen in the cars for the drivers 
I was going to say, what it, what what are you at the peak? What's the elevation there? 14,110 14, or 115. I've skydived a number of times and uh, always 12 and a half thousand feet. And that's when I was getting out. And it's thin. <laughs> They've got the little yeah. tubes for you to suck on up there. I can't imagine just hanging around and working, actually working and lugging shit and, and, t- and crewing at uh, 2,000 feet further. Yeah. So Larry Chen, there were times where I was in, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, suit and a helmet and a Hans and all this stuff, uh, like a space suit in there. And I look out and Larry's breathing with his mouth open, wide open, breathing like crazy. And I thought he looked kind of, I was like, why is Larry breathing so hard? And at the top, you know, he says, oh, you know, it's, trying you know, to oxygenate his out. blood. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's running around like a madman at 14,000 feet trying to get all the angles and, and, you know, different locations to shoot from. That's hard work at that altitude. Hard. Yeah. And and is you may as well be in speed. space at that point with with what yeah. you're lugging around and the fatigue yeah, never, it puts on your body. Pretty much, and, and he was such a superstar up there. He's their official photographer, which we didn't know when we assigned him. I I called Larry because I knew how familiar he was with the with the hill, and some of the very best photography from Pikes Peak has been coming from Larry and his team. And so, and we'd worked with him before, and he was wonderful to work with. So, you know, we got down to the bottom of the hill and he just said, you got all of me. And he fell asleep in the car on the way back to Colorado Springs. He was wow. done. He was, he was just spent. Spent. Completely. Shots. But the, wow. I mean, the shots were, the shots were just nuts. I mean, to close That's an that artist, room, by the way. Can we just acknowledge, I mean, that is an artist. Full on artist. He's a full on artist. He's, he's at the top of his game. Yeah. I mean, to, to be able to see if I can... No, go ahead. Just the way, yeah. The delay oh, makes gosh, it tricky, yeah. but but you know the some of the stuff that he got up there. I mean, to close that road and to be able to go up, um, some of the some of the some of the the shots were just mind blowing. Um, gosh. And to to sort of experience that road closed was was pretty wild. Um, you know it. it that's you can't really see the 935 probably, but there's a 935 ahead of the art car there. No, but this is enough to wet their whistle and tell them to go buy the magazine, <laughs> go sign, um, go subscribe. Yeah, well, it, hopefully that'd be great. Um, we we like to think it's a good gift for the holidays. Um, yeah. But uh, that's a lovely that's- segue. It <laughs> is a lovely gift for the holidays. That's a wonderful way to put it. How would people sign up? How do people find uh, you? Uh, we're easy on Instagram. It's zero 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 the numerals a magazine, and uh, the website's zero 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 magazine dot com. Uh, and yeah, those are the two easiest ways to find us. We're on Facebook as well, and a little on YouTube if you want to see uh, a couple of of early videos. But we're a print magazine company. We're not we're not competing for video uh, supremacy out there. That's we're what I love. Of- yeah, you're not going to find the polished. Th- yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, <laughs> I just we love know you our place. Out. I've wanted to do this for so long. I've I really have missed you. Like I felt like we had such a strong connection. We hung out that weekend a couple times here and there, and it, that was I looked it up. It was September of nineteen. It was over a year ago. Time flies. Time flies. It really does. And and we had a we had a blast too. And you know, if you'll ever have us back, we could just talk Porsche. Uh, you know, and I. I guess I guess what I would say is is let's put some pressure on you. What's what what could we? What do you want to talk about, Mr. Ryan? What 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 Porsche question or quandary have you had of late? Hmm. Open book time. Well, I, I'm having a hard time with newer Porsches, but it's only because of my issues with newer cars. It's not newer Porsches. I love newer Porsches. Um, but if I had to pick my favorite new Porsche, it probably wouldn't be a 911. What about you guys? If you're staying within the Porsche mark, what is your favorite new car? And it can be for any purpose or any reason for you. What is your favorite new car that they that they have out now currently? We current had this dis- we had this discussion on the way to to and from Pikes Peak actually, and mm-hmm. we ended up driving what was probably our favorite. I won't speak for Alex, but we ended up driving uh, a pair of GT4s effectively. One was a GT4, and one was the new Spider, which is now shared. You know suspension right. brakes all that is all gt department and i think we came to the conclusion of of the current lineup while we're in this limbo without certain 911 models 
um, I think it's I think it's Boxster Spider. I think wow. right now it's that's kind of uh, I probably <laughs> shouldn't talk about my side guilty pleasure affinity for base macans on this show, but <laughs> well, but, but tell uh, us, tell us. Okay, so it's the spider, but why, Alex? Well, I was gonna say I would love a spider with a nine nine two engine Carrera engine in it. That would kind of be my ultimate. Um, yes, there's something to be said for naturally aspirated engines, and it's amazing that Porsche still makes them. They're like one of the very last who do. Um, but when you drive the, the latest turbocharged flat six, it's an incredible engine. And I feel like if I could only have one new Porsche, I'd want that engine. The mm. problem is you have to get it in the 992, which – you know, is a fine car. It's just gotten huge. Yeah, yeah. that's my issue with it also. And it, it's also begun to start to feel big as well. It's just well, far too big. If they could just put that engine and that drivetrain in a smaller car, I'd be, I'd buy five of them. You so know? I want to challenge this conversation with a couple of hard points. And because I agree with you guys, perceptionally, the 991 was already too big for me. Perceptionally, in a parking lot, perceptionally while driving it, um, the car's a bit big for a 911. And Same when here. the 901.1 came out, I thought, okay, personally, maybe my road ends at 997. That was kind of the maximum size uh, for a 911 as I enjoy them. Yes. And then the 901.2 came out and they fixed a lot of things that bothered me about the 901.1. Me too. The steering was better. It was suddenly alert. The car was keen again. For me, it was it was driving things and aesthetics things. They changed both for me that made me like the point two better. Right, but but the, the perceptional size remains, and the thing I want to challenge you you two on is is sort of, and I challenge myself on this is it's only an inch and a half longer than a nine nine seven, and it's actually point one inch I think lower, mm -hmm. and it's the same width. So mm -hmm. it's the same width, same height one and a half inch longer on 170 some odd inches. So not very much percentage wise, but you've stated your case counselor. What's your point? I, I'm, I'm oh, going to disagree. Get there. Let me get there. <laughs> but I think a big part of why it feels bigger is the styling of the rear. Uh, taillights are going up. There's a cut line at the top a little bit is, is changed a little bit, but really what does it is the, um, they, they, they widen the interior a little bit and put that center tunnel in. And it's a four inch wheelbase stretch, which is huge. Yep. And until you realize that that four inch wheelbase stretch to 96.5 inches is exactly the same wheelbase as a 914. Ah, so how you. big, so how big is it really? You know, so, and I challenge my, I drive a 991 and I love it. It's, I kind of view it as, a perfect dad mobile because it's a little bigger. It's mm. sort of like an M3 coupe with the engine with the engine in the right place. Um, it's, What's the challenge? It's the challenge is is you say it's too big, but really it isn't much bigger than your 997. It's well, but it the, uh, hang on. Com if we're checking those boxes and we're comparing those dots and ones and zeros, then I would agree. But uh, that's not all that makes the car for for me. Uh, where the seat is makes a big difference. And, I agree. And, 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 and the pillars, the size of the pillars, basically for me, it comes to connectivity and separation, driver yes. from road, driver from mm -hmm. experience, all of that stuff. So it's not one thing. It's not an inch here, four inches here, whatever. It's To me, it's the aggregate of all of those changes over time, again, that have now gotten us to a place where I'm not as connected to the experience as I used to be. With that, I feel physically changed. In the car, I literally feel like I'm in a inside a room inside a car instead of inside of the car. Yes. 997 was it for me. I think both um, physically and then technologically as well. It's just a happy spot for me. Well, I would drive the piss out of a 992 every day if it was my demo or if somebody, you know, if, if Porsche was giving me a, one as a brand ambassador, I'll just plant the seed right now. Um, I love the cars for that, but it, I, I don't know if it has my money as a buyer. I don't think so. It's an so. interesting thing that, that but I'm I would not... go, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, please. No, I was going to change the subject and go to what I, what I would buy, but I don't want to get there if we're not there yet. 
All right. And I do want to get there, but I want to say that, you know, one of the things that I think you hit on, or at least reminded me is, you know, Alex, I've been talking about this a fair bit, is the greenhouse of the 991. You know, they changed the proportions and the 997 shares its greenhouse with the 996, which, yes. which is a pretty upright greenhouse by comparison, has very tall windows by comparison with the height of the doors. Yes. And the 991 kind of almost does that, um, what is it, third gen or fourth gen Supra thing where it looks like the roof is about a, a fifth too small for the car. Yeah. Uh, the yeah, nine well said. Door, not enough glass. Yeah, well yeah. said. In, in and, the, it looks like a bully's car, like they chopped mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it is definitely, it, it definitely is the lower, longer, wider, and it's beautiful. I think that the 991 basic shape is gorgeous. Agreed. But it changed, when I see it next to a 997, I miss the tall greenhouse. I like the big greenhouse. Me too. But that's not just the 991. That's almost all cars. You mentioned earlier new cars. You know, I see an 80s Accord go by, and you, and, and you just can't believe the, the – it almost looks like the window is taller than the door. You know, yeah. it's almost the inverse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And somewhere in the 90s, the, 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 the belt line just started rising and the windows started getting smaller. Well, that's and what I it just, is. The windows, the, I mean, if you talk to any designer, they'll tell you, Freeman is a prime example of this. They'll tell you that nowadays there's a box that they get from the bureaucrats, so to speak, the, 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 the insurance people saying, all right, you have to design around this box because within this box will be all of the safety, all of the guidelines, all of the, right. all of the stuff that they yep. all need and that that's every car supposedly so s apparently theoretically this also is what's leading to some of the size increases in the cars because in order to keep a shape you have to get it larger than said box yes yep. it seems to me that that is the nature of the problem for a lot of these things so when you look at older cars where there wasn't that box to design around there wasn't a safety precaution it was simply oh add a passive restraint add an airbag add a abs whatever it was um, it seems like they were the plan of attack was different. I think we are going to just eventually be in stylized boxes, right? That's what they're pushing us towards, anyway. Yes and no. I mean, you think about it, in the '80s. I remember my father talking about how all all the cars look the same now. You know, this was back in the. I 80s. remember that too. You know, so how much of it is as we age? Um, it's just cyclical. You think. There's well, some of that at work for sure. There's, for I sure. think there is some of that at work. And then also I think that cars have changed a lot in terms of identity. You think about the, some of the boxes that they had back then in the 80s and 70s in terms of headlights. And just think yeah. about how much headlights and taillight technology has allowed uh, styling to change. Um, do you remember you know, when you could identify a car from a half mile away based on the headlights? I do. My entire childhood. Mm -hmm. Almost to the yeah. year. For yeah, sure. well, good, good, good vision helps too. But um, sure. <laughs> but but uh, you know, it's it's a it, it's an interesting question because okay, so let's think about a Cord, Camry, uh, Altima, or something similar, or Maxima, let's say. Um, and there's others that should be added into that mix. Versus now, versus let's say 1987 what looked more similar what was mm -hmm. more three box mm -hmm. i would say that the cars have become less three box and nissan and some others have really dared to go outside the box quite a bit in their styling uh but that said you raise a really good point about the safety i mean the b pillar in a 991 is huge compared to the b pillar in a 997 and yeah. um you know those things are mandated and not always for bad reasons. Um, right. It's, uh, it's, it's all cars. It's not just Porsche. I got into Super the other day. I hit my elbow and my head. You know what I mean? Like it's just not enough room for, <laughs> for me. Um. Have, you ever read, have, you ever, have you ever been in a Lotus Europa, the old ones? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember. Maybe not. So I, so I got in one when I was in high school. A uh, guy had a nine. Didn't they used to have the bubble in the hood and the roof? I think they might have. Did they yes, have I a think bubble they did. The roof? I think I they might have. So he was a reasonably sized guy, and I'm six one, and I get in the thing, and it's just it, it made my nine fourteen seem like a Cadillac, which is oh, saying that. I mean, they are they are. It tiny. has a tunnel too, probably right, which big the nine fourteen does. Big yeah. center tunnel, yeah, big center. Yeah. Tunnel. And so I noticed, you know, the car was so light; it weighed so much less than even a nine fourteen. I said, 
I said, why does this thing have power windows if Colin Chapman was so into you know, adding lightness? And he said, yeah, because you can't move your elbows to roll down the window. It's not possible. To- <laughs> it was power windows out of necessity, mm-hmm. not out of, out of choice. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. The, 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 the more things change, the more they stay the same, I think. You know, yeah. Porsche has a lot of boxes it has to fit, so do all car makers. Um, how do I feel about the identity of the new Supra being shared with a BMW? You know, there's there's some like church and state stuff going on there that I'm kind of tweaked out about. I didn't like it until they came out and I preferred the Supra. Joke's on me. Oh, we, Joke's on me. Yeah, I agree. By the way, have you been to race service? Uh, they've got a super project that is incredible. Um, I haven't been to race service. In fact, I only even found out about them recently and I'm dying to get over there. I think they do like a midweek or pre COVID anyway, they would even do a midweek thing. So uh, thank you for bringing race. service. You should definitely check out this. They're putting a, uh, a Judd V10 in a Supra, um, which is pretty wild. So, um, yeah, they're, they're doing some cool stuff over there. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's just it's just neat. The car hobby, even in 2020, there's still creativity. There's still things going on. But uh, I want to ask you, we got off this big segue about size. So what would it be, Mr. Ryan? What, what, what would you choose? Oh, uh, what, uh, what would your well, your choice? T- Tycons aside, the Tycon line aside, because I haven't driven all of them and, and certainly not on the on the line. Uh, the the Sport Turismo, the, the Zwart uh, wagon that he's got. Ah. I love the looks of it. Panamera I love Sport. the dr- drive of it, the Panamera Sport Turismo. Yeah, I, I really, really have a, a hankering for that car. I think it's genuinely good looking. It's got everything to get you wherever you want to go in any kind of style you want. Um, and I just, I really like the looks of it. For, for, the, for the, the Sport Wagon shootout, the RS6 is damn good looking for me, but I think the Sport Turismo might might win out for me in, in looks alone. And those yeah, wagons, I like a big wagon. I like the AMGs. I like them all. I think they're cool. Of course. Yeah, we've always been. I mean, if we had an M5 wagon. wagon, you know I'd be that guy. Alex did have an M5 wagon. One of the BMWs in my stable. Oh, he, he wow. Did. And, and is, is it, but they didn't, how did you, did you homologate it? How did you do it? Um, I brought it in from Europe. It was an Italian specification car that had ended up in the UK, and I bought it out of the UK and brought it in. What uh, generation? E34. There were only oh, two generations. Oh, so cool. Again, yeah, so that was, that was the one. And you, Again, uh, you talk about that big greenhouse. Look at that car. Oh, yeah. A huge greenhouse. Huge and greenhouse. stunning. I mean, no matter where you sit in that car, you can see out of it. Oh, it's incredible. One of the best designs. One of BMW's best body designs, I think, of all time. Does the M5 Which, have back have have the rear it doesn't have uh, the rear rear seats, there's right? No third row of seats, okay. no. But but it was the first car, I believe, the first modern car to have a dual panel sunroof. It actually has a front right. rear sunroof, which is pretty right. cool. Oh, yeah, so stinking cool. cool. Uh is it is it is it a manual? Yeah, they were all manuals. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, yeah, that was that was a pretty cool car. Um, I don't have oh it anymore. Gosh. It, it uh, I sold it to someone who then put it on bring a trailer and sold it to someone else. So I don't know where it is now. But, uh, oh, shame. That was a fantastic car. But it wouldn't be. It won't be hard to spot because it's got to be what. What was the actual color? It was basically British racing. It was. It was BMW British racing green, non-metallic. So it was. It was actually an Italian special edition. Italy was the biggest market for that car outside of Germany. So at was the end, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No. So at the end, when they were just about to stop building them, three BMW dealers in Italy said, "Let's you know pool our resources and each order a certain percentage of a special edition kind of runout model." And so BMW ended up building ten of them in silver with a blue interior. 10 of them in British racing green with a dark tan interior. They called it hazelnut. And I had one of the green ones. Um, so it was, it was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty cool car. That is so cool. So that was the question. I almost interrupted you, uh, what your interior was because British racing green for me goes great on a, some version of Brown. Yeah. So whoever specced this and what was fascinating is they used. So in, even by the mid nineties, when this car was built, 
BMW individual had a big range of colors and a big range of upholsteries. Mm. So they, someone was very smart either at BMW Italy, or maybe they asked the advice of someone at BMW in Germany to help them spec it. I don't, I don't know how it all went down, but whoever was in charge paired that British racing green to the hazelnut, which was perfect. And then what they did is kind of the, the piece de resistance to like throw it all together is they spec the carpet in green. So all the Whoa. carpeting- in instead of, it probably would have been black. black. So all the carpeting was a dark green. Whoa, that must have been wild. Yeah, it was really great. The car was incredible with all the leather gear, like the the the, the hand formed leather to the center console stuff with all the little pockets, all the little yeah. trays. Yep. And the had had, had leather seatbelt receptacles and I mean, yeah, it was very nicely done. It, it was and it was a really specific shade of brown. It wasn't like Porsche espresso that's like a very chocolatey brown or even cocoa this had like it wasn't quite terracotta but it had a, a little bit of a reddish hue to the brown yeah was, i know what you mean a, there was a there was a volvo color that that had a little bit of orange in it as well and, yeah and i know or, exactly what you mean it comes out almost kind of a creamy caramelly kind of a color it, it, yes yeah. yeah it was that was a stunner but so we've always been into fast wagons we you yeah. know when the, so pan, cool. when the first Panamera came out and they brought out that very first wagon concept, Alex and I were, why didn't they make this the first one? Right. But we car enthusiasts do get things wrong. You know, they, they with the, with the sport turismo, they thought, Oh, in North America, this thing's gonna, it's so good looking everything. We're all saying it's so good looking. And for a little while it sold really well. And then it didn't leveled uh, off. Yeah. yeah. Everybody who it's wanted it, got it. A rare car. Apparently, they're going to repeat it with the Taycan wagon, Sport Turismo. So that that'll be interesting. As long as it's remotely as good looking, and if anything, the Taycan's actually a tiny. It feels anyway. I don't know if it is smaller, Pete. Maybe you guys, you guys, maybe know it is smaller, right? Uh, yeah. So maybe even to have a, t a slightly smaller wagon um, would be pretty cool. I'd like that. Uh, guys, we did it. We've done the time. How do you feel? We finally got online. We finally did this. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, next time we should do a test to make sure the print magazine people can, you know, uh, get on the <laughs> thing. Um, See if you can get online. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I think everything's great. I think it worked out fantastic. If anything, it loosened everybody up. It's a shame we didn't get to go live, but so what? Everybody gets to see it today on Thanksgiving. That's today right. on Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You know, so, <laughs> so, all right. And on that note, can I just want to, I've got another question for you. Sure. Is, Specifically, what are you thankful for today? You know what? I am. You're going to get a surprise answer out of me, I bet. And it's going to be probably a little deeper than you would have expected. I am surprisingly grateful for something today that is something very personal, but I am going to share it with you, our audience. Um, it's no secret that I don't get along with my mother. We've got a history. There's a whole thing there. Um, there's a lot of reasons it's nobody's fault. It's just history, family, you know how that stuff goes. Uh, recently we have begun talking and we have begun, a, a, a what I believe will be the beginnings of a very good adult relationship for us both. And, uh, I just wanted to say that I am absolutely to the universe. I'm grateful for it because it's not something I thought I wanted. It's not something I thought I missed, but, um, having it currently in my heart makes me really feel, um, mm -hmm. good something to be grateful for. So um, <laughs> that, of course, my lovely wife, Nicole, of course, this amazing life that we live, um, the Porsche people that are in our community, and certainly the folks that watch this show, um, and friends like you, Pete and Alex. My gosh, I guess I'm grateful for a heck of a lot. <laughs> right on, right on. And, and good on you for, I mean, it, it, you know, families can be an odd thing. I, yeah. I'm not sure there are any such thing as normal uh, families. And so I'm really glad to hear that your relationship with your mom is taken. Mending. How should, should we say mending? Yeah. 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 Mending. Well, that's something to be thankful for, for sure. Absolutely. Um, how you about have, you guys? Alex? Oh, man. I'm just thankful that in this totally strange year, there's still some way to have meaningful human connection. Mm. 
you know? Absolutely. It's such an isolating time in many ways. And, you know, to be able to use technology, I, I guess my point is mad props to technology for once, because imagine going through <laughs> the whole thing with no way to visually or, or audibly connect to people who are far away. You Just know? the morning and afternoon newspapers. That's how yeah. you would get your news. I mean, we'd be communicating with like faxes and carrier pigeons or something. Right? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I just, I feel that, you know, being able to have people in my life that I can maintain kind of a human connection with through all this changes the way you cope. You know, it's, it keeps, it keeps you feeling human, which is not often easy to do these days. It's a great answer. Totally yeah. true. And, and, you know, you think about, uh, I've thought about this increasingly in these months. You know, we, we ridicule and occasionally rightly so uh, Webvan 3.0, which is Amazon, um, and so many other, you know, internet-based things. But, but aside from the amount of screen time, which does concern me uh, with all this, Think about what this pandemic might have been like 20 years ago, as as dot com was just kind of a was kind of a not a novelty, but so new, yeah, and so primitive, and it really took about 20 years for the promise of things like Webvan and other stuff to come to fruition. Yep, and it's 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 not to say that Amazon doesn't have its issues because it certainly does, but if you look at that company and some others. Think about it. it's not just what they've created in e-commerce and innovated and what's made it possible for people not only to get what they need, but also to avoid contact um, in this pandemic. I, to, right. To it's like it's yeah. ideally suited for it. Yeah, it's ideally suited for that um, as a supply system. But also, you know, you watched it as it started with various delivery systems and eventually effectively created its own FedEx. Like it built out another system yeah um you know after you know it still supports usps or it did for quite some time and you see sunday delivery of usps which is crazy we never saw that five years ago but no basically these companies built out those systems and here's zoom as well and 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 teams and all these other things and i agree you know we have a lot to be thankful for for people who have often been vilified um for the destruction of, of interaction and other things. And um, there's no question, especially as, as we're being encouraged not to visit family. Today. Right. You know, right. Yeah. That's, uh, that's tough. I mean, they canceled Thanksgiving essentially. Yeah. Whether you, whether and, and you, uh, asking, whether you, whether you follow or not, I mean, that's kind of what happened. And they're asking to cancel Christmas too. So, and, and, and for the sake of many. And so um, I, yeah, I, I think that is right. We do have, technology for once to thank you uh, on this stuff. Uh, there's no question. That's so cool. Uh, well, with that, I think it's a great time to mention if you're in a part of the country or the world for that matter, where you should be wearing a mask and you see someone who isn't, you could say to them, Hey, need a mask? Shop Hunziger.com. That's what we did. <laughs> and then I wouldn't hang around. I would, I would skedaddle <laughs> right out of there after that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't stick around to see how it works out. Um, also, also, I have to mention our friends over at St. Clair Insurance. You might happen to notice they put in a building right across the way there in the wide shot. <laughs> there we go, St. Clair Insurance. They say all that separates men and boys is the coverage for their toys. St. Clair Insurance has coverage for your toys. What kind of toys? Pete Stout? Portions? <laughs> Any kind of toy, sure, porches, collector cars, it doesn't matter. We were talking about it yesterday. We were trying to figure out maybe uh, 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 like those ultralights. I wonder if they do airplanes because um, anything that requires insurance, you could get it through St. Clair. And we highly encourage you to check out their website, coverageforyourtoys.com. Um, coverageforyourtoys.com, 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 our friends at St. Clair Insurance. Uh, if you already have Haggerty, if you're a Haggerty customer and have a, a, a policy for your collector cars, Maybe you got that through Haggerty. Maybe you have a rep. If you don't have a rep, they actually encourage you to have a rep. So go to coverageforyourtoys.com and get yourself a rep. There's no additional cost. There's nothing different. They'll transfer your account over everything very easily for you. You don't have to do anything. All you got to do is go to coverageforyourtoys.com. Sign up. <laughs> 
Guys, how do you feel? Did we do good? Did we finish this? I think this is a great uh, point to uh, exit on. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, my well, thanks to both. Importantly, Al- how do you feel about this? I feel great. It was great to catch up with you. I want to do another show with the Misses, Misses, Rebecca and Nicole. I think that would be fun. That'd be fun. How is Nicole doing? She's okay. She's okay. Uh, good days, bad days. Uh, we've introduced a wheelchair to our life, which is a bummer, but it is what it is. It fits in the back of the 997 rather creatively, but it does. So, um, you know, life is. Life is continuing. We get up every day. We keep doing it. What are you going to do, right? I love the way you love her, man. <laughs> Speaking of, I, sh- I highly recommend anybody else check out her blog. It's on WordPress. It's a new life of old Nicole. I think it's probably wordpress.newlifeofoldnicole.com. Check it out. Good stuff. A lot of her old stories from when she was, uh, you know, a hot shot in Hollywood. Um, and uh, all of the people she keeps posting pictures with and stories about, it's really neat because they're the really interesting stories from her old life but no names no faces you kind of have to sort of put the pieces together and you can if you want to um but even if you don't have the interest in doing that they're a really enjoyable read so check it out they're almost poetic some of those entries uh i I read those and i'm shocked by the candor as well as the as well as sort of the she's got a voice i mean we knew that but i evaluate writing for part of my work and and I find her pieces uh, to be engaging and shocking at times and mm. extremely um, open. But that's yes. something we know of Nicole. That's Nicole. You know, you yes. see that goes as I, well. I celebrate you saying that and I celebrate her having the courage to do it because this is not something she, the old Nicole would have actually done. This is the new life of old Nicole who's actually dumping it out. So God bless you for saying that. Seriously, man means a yeah, lot well, and, and will mean a lot to her god bless her for writing these entries they, they really stand out when i when i run across them on facebook or elsewhere um those entries stop me cold they they are separate from everything else in the feed wow um they really stand out as different and they're so real that, and raw they're real and raw and unedited raw also. Is a great you know, word. she doesn't have anyone look at them she might do a couple passes herself but she puts it out she self-publishes so it's raw is a raw is a great word and i think that's where a lot of the power is that's awesome well thank you pete stout thank you so much alex this was really uh, everybody check out triple zero so magazine much. like and subscribe it's a great 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 gift for the holidays absolutely we think so we think yeah. so. so happy thanksgiving to everybody at home thank you for spending an hour or so with us here in the play set uh we will be back next week with new live shows with uh adam ferrara as my guest uh, from uh top gear he was a host on top gear he was on rescue me He's a wonderfully funny stand-up comedian as well uh, and a huge car guy. So that's what's going on. Have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy the rest of this evening, whatever's going on. Tomorrow, Friday, we will be at uh, Breakfast Club. It's Black Friday. If you're not um, (laughs) on BestBuy.com or Amazon or whatever, come on out. Drive your Porsche or whatever. It's not a club. All welcome. Newcomb's Ranch, 9 to 11 on Friday. And uh, that's it. Have a great weekend. We'll see you out there. Love everybody. Please love one another. Bye. Awesome.